Still another way that the College Board has made your life easier and our choices harder is that the required works list now includes only two early Italian Renaissance paintings, Fra Filippo Lippi's Madonna and Child with Two Angels and Botticelli's Birth of Venus. They're both wonderful paintings and I look forward to exploring them in more depth. But I refuse to give in entirely to the College Board's agenda, especially since the particular two chosen works do not display some of the most innovative and characteristic features of early Italian Renaissance painting. Sister Wendy chose to kick off her discussion of the early Italian Renaissance with Masaccio, and so I will follow her example. You saw this painting in her lecture. What elements of this painting's form show Giotto's influence, and which show Masaccio's movement beyond the Proto-Renaissance? Like Giotto, Masaccio uses a figure with his back to us to draw the viewer into the painting. Really, the man in the orange doublet with bare legs is a stand-in for us, the viewer. The fully modeled figures, like Giotto's, have volume and weight defined by chiaroscuro, but now we're seeing musculature as well. The bare legs help. Both the Giotto painting and the Masaccio use atmospheric perspective. For some reason, that word uh, wording is not showing up in front of the arrow here. What that means is that objects further away are blurrier, softer in value, and bluer. But Masaccio's gradations are subtler and more realistic. He's taking nature as an actual model but I still haven't identified the really big difference. Any guesses? The Tribute Money is one of the earliest paintings to employ mathematical perspective. Masaccio was a close friend of Brunelleschi's and he knew his studies of perspective very well. Note how the orthogonals converge on Christ's head. And as this close-up of one of the faces reveal, Masaccio also made more use of contrasts of light and dark to define volume and space. You remember the term for this, right? You saw a similar illustration in your textbook. So here's another famous Masaccio painting and a favorite of Miss Jacobs. We see God the Father holding up God the Son with God the Spirit as a rather hard to see dove on Christ's head. The viewer's eye is drawn up to figures of the Trinity, but also down to the skeletal memento mori below the figures, which served as a reminder that we all die. The deep recess, which is entirely a pictorial illusion, draws the viewer into the scene and therefore into communion with the triune God. The perspectival composition of this painting is extraordinarily accurate and extraordinarily complex. Note that the composition is based on a series of triangles, itself a representation of the Trinity. Also note that the patrons are larger than the figures of Mary and John at the base of the cross. Since the patrons are closer to us in space, they should be larger, but this is significant because optical perspective has replaced conceptual perspective. And finally, we get to a required work. If you had time to watch the extra credit Medici video, you know that the monk who painted this work was not as angelic as Fra Angelico, and for that matter, his angels aren't as angelic either. Some art historians think that the angel looking at out at us from the bottom right with an impish smile, is Lippi's son with the nun he ran off with, a boy who grew up to be another famous Renaissance painter, Filipino Lippi. Indeed, the model for the Madonna may have been Filipino's mother, Lucretia, although neither of these identifications has been confirmed. So, what's happened to the halo? Well, it's almost disappeared, and soon it will disappear altogether in the Renaissance pursuit of more naturalism. So how would you compare this to Giotto's Madonna and Child, which I've just pulled up on the right? Both the figures have weight and substance. If anything, Giotto's Mary has the more obvious physical form. But Lippi's Mary and Baby are more human, even more sensual. Lippi's Mary has a much more secular beauty and setting. Look at that huge pearl over Mary's finely coiffured hair and the string of pearls receding in a striking triangle from her high forehead. She sits on an ornate piece of furniture in a gray stone window through which we see cultivated fields, soaring rocks, and a distant city. So yes, there is a little perspective there. This is crucial to the painting's intimacy because it brings the Madonna forward toward us. Her shadow is on the frame in a painting lit from the right, another physical as opposed to spiritual detail. She's placed in front of the window like an actor at the front of a stage. The realistic landscape is another Renaissance feature. Lippi was influenced by Flemish landscapes, stay tuned. 
This is an identifiable Florence scene with the River Arno in the background. Again, more Renaissance naturalism. So let's look quickly at a few other paintings by Lippi, both to help you in case you get hit by an attribution question and to tease out some of the formal qualities of his painting. In general, Lippi is less interested in perspective than even chiaroscuro and more interested in the play of line than, say, Masaccio. And one reason for this, and this is also true of Botticelli, is that he painted an egg tempera. Because tempera dried very quickly, it was hard to create subtle blends of color, although both Giotto and Masaccio pulled it off. Still, the medium lends itself to crisper, clearer lines with brilliant colors and fewer gradations of tone. So, these angels don't look like they're up to as much mischief as the one we just saw, but note the beautiful, serene faces and, again, the strong use of line, especially in the flowers. Almost all of Lippi's paintings were religious and most were of Mary, but the painting on the right is actually the earliest surviving double portrait in Italian art. Note, again, the strong use of line and the emphasis on the woman's luxurious clothing. So none of our early Italian Renaissance required works is a portrait, but in fact the Renaissance emphasis on individual achievement, the admiration of Roman portrait statues, and the growing patronage of wealthy merchants all created a demand for portraits. You just saw a lippy example. Here are two paintings by the Florentine painter Girlandaio. Note again how much individual personality even the rather austere profile portrait conveys. Oh, Miss Jacobs and I love this painting and wish we could linger. But notice how the painter uses foreshortening line and perspective to bring order to this chaotic battle scene, while the diagonal spears add rhythm and energy. So I'm going to end my early Renaissance painting lecture with Botticelli. This is the College Board's other early Renaissance painting required work, and it's probably a painting you would have recognized even before you took this course. Botticelli, likewise, was less obsessed with perspective than his Florentine contemporaries. And Botticelli was another of our artists who thrived under the patronage of the Medici. In his case, Cosimo's grandson, Lorenzo the Magnificent. Several of these figures are identifiable historical personages. The older man kneeling in front of the Virgin is Cosimo de' Medici. The arrogant young man on the left is his grandson, Lorenzo the Magnificent, and the figure on the right looking out at the viewer is probably Botticelli himself. So back to our Venus. The statue on the left is the Venus de' Medici, or Modest Venus, a first century BCE Hellenistic copy, perhaps of a work by Praxiteles. It was one of the Medici family's prized possessions. See the resemblance? Botticelli was clearly sucking up to his patrons with their interest in the classical world. Lorenzo the Magnificent had earlier commissioned a verse form of Hesiod's account of Venus's birth. This was a very important story to a very important patron. And it's quite a story. According to Hesiod, Cronus cut off Uranus's genitals and cast them into the sea. The foam symbolizes his semen. Aphrodite, or Venus, was born fully grown from that foam. She rested on the shell until she drifted to shore, blown by the zephyrs, or winds, and you see those on the left. When she arrived, she was greeted by one of the three graces who covered her up properly. So what made the content so innovative? Maybe a little shocking. Well, mythological subjects were popular in literature, but they were just starting to make a comeback in art. Botticelli spearheaded this movement, and he also used mythological scenes as an excuse to explore the female nude. This was the first monumental female nude of a pagan goddess since Roman times. Although it wasn't the first female nude, Eve got to show up in paintings without her clothes pretty often, which may account for some of the popularity of this theme in religious art. The use of canvas was another innovation. Previously, this material had been used mostly for parade banners, and actually, this painting's original function may have been as a banner in one of Florence's many festive parades, perhaps in honor of a wedding. To add a historical note, I can't resist. This painting disappeared into obscurity almost immediately along with Botticelli's reputation. 
when Napoleon ransacked the Italian collections in the early 19th century, he didn't even bother stealing any Botticelli's. In 1815, after the Napoleonic Wars, the painting was mute, moved from the Medici Palace to the Uffizi, but it was not considered one of the museum's major works. It only regained notice and popularity at the end of the 19th century, when English art critics' uh, taste came back to Botticelli's style. So what would you note about the painting's form? Well, I'm struck by how much motion there is in the painting. The outflung cloak, the blowing hair, the zephyrs alighting on the shore. Like Lippi, Botticelli relied heavily on line. Note the exquisite detail of the plants and the rhythmic pattern of the clothing and shell. His colors are bright but soft. The values in the painting are not high. And while the receding sea and small boat create a horizon and a sense of space, we don't see the kind of technical show-off perspective of, say, Masaccio's works. So let's look at a few other famous Botticelli's. This painting, along with the Birth of Venus, which we'll see in a moment, uh, excuse me, along with Primavera, Birth of Venus and Primavera, which we'll see in a moment, are sometimes referred to as furniture paintings or even bedroom paintings. They were private paintings intended for the bedroom. That long, narrow shape fit easily over a bed. And in that spirit, here's one of Botticelli's most famous bedroom paintings. Note that these last three paintings have all addressed mythological themes. But of course, Botticelli painted religious themes as well. Most of the market for, was for religious art. Remember his Judith, not one of Botticelli's finest works, to my mind. I love his Madonna and Child, but I'd hate to be asked whether the painter was Botticelli or Lippi. The Botticelli story does not end happily. At the end of the 15th century, a Dominican friar, Savonarola, attracted huge crowds with sermons warning Florentines that they were heading to hell if they did not abandon their materialistic ways and especially their wicked art. His timing was terrific. In 1494, the King of France invaded Italy, seeming to fulfill Savonarola's prophecies. At the monks' urgings, the Florentines expelled the ruling Medici, established a popular republic, and set out to destroy wicked works of literature and art in huge bonfires, the so-called bonfires of the vanities. Botticelli became a follower of Savonarola. He may or may not have burned some of his paintings in the bonfire. The record isn't clear, but he did paint this scene from Greek history of an innocent youth being attacked by slander. It may have been Botticelli's defense of Savonarola, who was eventually executed for slandering the Pope. The second part of the Medici video has a terrific account of this episode, which we don't have time to show in class. The link is up on Moodle. And now we head north and back in time again to the splendid works of the Northern Renaissance.